going to let Gary take over and introduce the, the theme of the panel. Thanks, Sandy. Good morning, everyone. It's Gary Rosenblatt, by the way. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. That's okay. okay. Don't conform. You were close. No. It was close. Oh. Good enough. <laughs> it's called a typo. <laughs> <laughs> right. I need so uh, we're honored to have uh, two distinguished presenters this morning, and we're going to be talking about uh, philanthropy in this country and in Russia, and uh, particularly about how they became involved in their own philanthropy and some of their ideas about it. So I just wanted to, um, by way of starting, there's a story told about a famous Israeli philosopher who comes to America for his first trip. And uh, on the day he arrives, he's asked um, by the radio announcer, could you tell us, sir, in a word, how are things in Israel? And he says, good. And he said, uh, in two words? He said, no good. <laughs> uh, so I, I think a lot of that can be said about uh, the Jewish experience, about uh, American and Jewish life and life in Israel and in much of the diaspora as well. It depends uh, in some ways how we look at it, and in some ways things are going very well, and in other ways there are uh, serious problems. But today we're going to focus uh, on the issue of, of philanthropy, and I thought um, in starting I would ask uh, each of you, uh, and by the way this is Sir Len Blavatnik, but he's kind enough to say I could call him Len. Um, Okay, <laughs> I'll remember that. Um, I'm going to ask each of you if you could uh, briefly tell us a little bit about um, your mentor in, in terms of your philanthropy and uh, your approach to that, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail. So if we can start with, we'll start with you, Matthew. Okay, good morning, everybody. <coughs> thank you, Gary, and thank you, Len, uh, for joining us. Um, <coughs> for me, that the the question of who is a, uh, a mentor for me is very easy. It, it was my father. Um, there were others, of course, involved. Uh, in my uncle, my grandfather, people on my mother's side as well. But really, the mentor uh, for me was my father. Um, and I had the privilege of traveling with him uh, when he was president of the World Jewish Congress, really starting in 1990 was my first trip with him to what is now uh, Russia was then the, the Soviet Union. Uh, and that was my first exposure to uh, sort of what was going on in Russia, in the Soviet Union, with the Jewish people. Um, and you know, it's one thing to watch people write checks. It's another thing to watch people take action and do things. And for me, sort of the privilege of being able to travel with my father and see him in action, see him actually, the, the amount of passion he had, how he cared, uh, for the future of the Jewish people was, for me, uh, the inspiration that has sort of guided uh, what I do uh, with my time and, and my, compared to Len, very limited resources. Well, I, um, I actually didn't have any particular mentor, I would say, kind of came to me in stages. Um, but when I lived in London, I would say closest came to a mentor was um, Lord George Weidenfeld. I don't know if you knew him. He was a remarkable Jewish man who um, uh, is, yeah, escaped from Vienna in 1937 uh, and became really a, a grand figure of English establishment, a lord, received um, all the highest awards from the queen. Uh, at the age of 26, I think he was a chief of staff for Weizmann, first president of um, Israel, and in uh, very many ways a remarkable man, and uh, he, he quite influenced me um, kind of to do big things in philanthropy. And by the way, can I just say, um, uh, Gary, that the joke you told, I've heard the same joke about uh, uh, President Boris Yeltsin, and he was asked about state of Russian economy. <laughs> Some things are universal. <laughs> Um, if I could follow up with you, um, 
in, in terms, uh, a lot of your philanthropy is for cultural programs, educational programs, uh, museums, arts, things like that. I wonder how you, um, in your decision making, how you decide um, in terms of Jewish philanthropy. I know you're very much involved with Chabad programs. Um, is there a formula you have, or is it uh, as it appears? How, how does that work? Oh, it appears as a formula. <laughs> um, well, w w if there is a formula, it's probably not to do too many things, uh, but um, I, I do try to uh, kind of help a, a, a lot of uh, various people and organizations. Um, the, the Jewish kind of um, philanthropy is probably centered in a couple of things. One is Chabad because I think over the years they've proven that um, they're willing to go far and do you know, a lot of things other people don't want to do. Uh, I've seen them in places like Kazakhstan in the 90s uh, where you know, there was very little remaining Jewish presence, um, but they would show up in some town in the middle of nowhere and with the money from a few Jewish um, um, businessmen build the synagogue and I remember being at the opening of one of them, uh, place was called, I really don't remember, it was like a, uh, Eastern Kazakhstan and um, um, Alexander Mashkevich uh, funded it and they built a really beautiful synagogue and I asked him, are there enough Jews for even a minion and, they sa and the rabbi said, build and they will come. <laughs> and uh, apparently they you know, had uh, several hundred Jews from like neighboring areas. So in any case, uh, and also, um, so you know, I've been uh, kind of working with Chabad for many years um, in Israel as well. Um, probably, probably the most of my money goes to Israeli initiatives, uh, where they they help the poor, the wounded soldiers, and you know, various kind of underserviced probably segments of the society. Um, and on the cultural side, you know, my favorite example is actually Jewish Museum in Moscow, uh, which is. Um, um, you know, probably the, the first proper uh, museum of Jewish history in uh, in the former Russian Empire, where you know, most of um, Jews, at least we know or I know, <laughs> come from, um, and um, it's Jewish of uh, Jewish history and a tolerance center. And uh, for those who haven't been there or have a chance to go, it's really a beautiful museum. Uh, properly done uh, and run really in a very good way. Um, and also essentially uh, created because of the drive from the Chabad rabbi in Moscow. Yeah, I was just gonna say on a trip uh, to, to Kiev a few years ago with a, a, a mission, um, I had an opportunity to meet with uh, the rabbi there who's a young man from Brooklyn and um, he said the reason why we're, we're different than uh, other groups, he said the first thing we do when we come to a community is we, we buy two cemetery plots. So the, the people in the community know we're here to stay. So I think it's that kind of commitment that, uh, that you're talking about that's, that's uh, very powerful. Yeah. I just want to say uh, two things. One is the rabbi <coughs> that Len is referring to is a guy named Beryl Lazar. And Beryl is the chief rabbi of Russia, Chabad. Um, a really, really, I think, very, very special man. Um, and when we did our first limud in Moscow in 2006, he was very dismissive of us because in his experience, which is absolutely true, organizations had come, sort of tried to engage with young Russian Jews and had failed. And he very, and he very much, was, he went there, I think he came to join us because frankly, as I mentioned, my, my mentor, because of the, the legacy of my father. Um, and he thought, out of respect, he would come and, and say hello to us and honor us with his presence. But he really told us, you're not going to be here very long, so whatever. And then two years ago, almost exactly, two years ago, we had our executive committee meeting in, uh, in Monte Carlo, because I, as Sandy mentioned, I'm chairman, but our president, uh, Aaron Franco lives in Monaco. His son was doing bar mitzvah, so we were all gathered there. 
And Beryl Lazar came, and at our executive committee, he said, I am, on your, I am your partner. I am, uh, want to be on your executive committee because I've never seen an organization other than Chabad that has been able to engage young Russian Jews, and I'm your partner, and I will continue to be your partner. And very personally for me, he flew to Jerusalem a year ago, April, to perform my wedding uh, on the roof of Eshet Torah. So I have a strong connection to, uh, to Beryl Lazar, as we do at Limud now. And, uh, and one final little thing, I was in Tbilisi two weeks ago and went to the Chabad Shul, which is named Beit Ruth, which is the mother of Alexander Moskevich. So Matthew, um, as y your leading role here at Limud FSU, yeah. um, as we've said, there, there are many good causes, many, um, many uh, opportunities for philanthropy. How did you choose to be this involved in this, this project? So uh, Chaim uh, approached me in 2006 uh, with the concept, and I didn't know what Limud was. He explained it to me. I'll make the story very short. Um, <coughs> and, and I really didn't believe that we were going to be successful, but Chaim is a force of nature. Um, and w but it resonated with me because, my, as I said, started, this was in 2006, and starting in 1990, I'd been traveling with my father, getting involved in, in Russian-Jewish uh, affairs, <coughs> and understood that there was this incredible need for Jewish learning. And the movement, which you have documented, and Dan has documented, from the 70s, or, or even, even perhaps earlier, was let my people go. And by the time I got involved with Limud, we, had, we were transforming that from let my people go to let my people know. What we do is Jewish education. We want, and we want people to engage in, in their Jewish journey in any way they want, whether it's through listening to lectures about philanthropy or politics or poetry or religion or whatever sort of floats their boat. We just want to engage young Jews, Jews actually of all ages, in their Jewish journey. And um, given the, the lack of ability to be Jewish and to, to learn about Judaism for the seven decades of, of communism, I felt it was something that was really important. I was going to just mention, if, if you each have questions or comments for each other, feel free to, to take the mic or let me know. So uh, in the last few weeks, um, a study was uh, released by the Avi Chai Foundation um, on, on the trends in Jewish philanthropy, in mostly in North America. And one of the things they found was that um, while federations used to be sort of driving the agenda over the last period of time, it's been more foundations and th that those foundations are primarily trying to engage millennials, as we're talking about uh, just a moment ago. It's a lot about um, engaging younger people who are more distanced from, perhaps from Israel, from Jewish organizational life, from religious life. And one of the comments is that a lot of these projects are um, sort of uh, one-offs. They're um, you know, an event or uh, a program or a Shabbat Friday night dinner, uh, rather than um, intensive Jewish education. And there was some debate about that. Um, I just was going to ask each of you your thoughts about what's the most effective way and, and what should be the target for most of the Jewish philanthropy that we see. Okay, I haven't thought about that that much, uh, but, um, uh, you know, I think uh, I think everyone should do what they most interested in. I used to think that there are too many Jewish organizations and doing too many different things. Then I had a conversation with Pinkus Goldsmith, uh, if you know also, who at that time was a rabbi at, in, in Russia, and um, he um, <laughs> he convinced me that <laughs> first of all you will never organize kind of one organization anyway <laughs> of Jews. <laughs> And the second, you know, the more the better. So now I think everyone should be doing what they're interested in. Um, and there are a lot of different things. But um, I in my opinion, you know, you have to engage young people and um, probably in campus life and uh, universities, um, kind of the place to do it. Uh, for me, a good example is, again, we go back to Chabad. 
uh, Chabad at Harvard. And when I was going uh, going there, there was only um, at Harvard. Where there was only uh, what's the other one? Hillel, Hillel sorry, <laughs> and uh, which was kind of very boring and depressing, at least at that time. And um, and um, you know, Chabad created competition, and same as in business, competition works. So I think now you have two good organizations, uh, but it engages a lot of uh, young people who wouldn't be engaged otherwise. And I think uh, you know, campus campus life is kind of where a lot of ideas are formed. I, I would say that would be a priority. I, I first of all, I totally agree with Len that <coughs> uh, campus, college campuses are a place where uh, if it's very very important for us to engage with with the young young Jewish students and one of our supporters and members of our board, Tom Bloomberg, is here and was for I think fifteen years head of Hillel United States. Um, <coughs> my dad was actually the founding chairman of Hillel International, um, and engaging on college campuses is critical. I mean, but you know, Len also said, and, and I think he's totally right, that you have to engage both Jews where they are and what's important to you. Um, so, you know, I, th I think you just whether it's cultural or social or religious or political. You know, you're kind of a. You have to be flexible, and you have to do things that are passion that you're passionate about. And b. You have to sort of listen to the millennials, to listen to the young people, hear what's important to them, what's interesting to them, and engage them on their level too. If we try, one of the beauties of Limud, you see, that we're going to have four to six lectures going on simultaneously. People get to go where they want to go, and you've got, and that's what's important to us. Right? You get to to listen to and think about and engage on things that are important to you. And uh, if we try to do a top-down Jewish, in the way it used to be with the federations, if it was too top-down and too top-heavy, then I think you lose the interest and engagement of the next generation. This is Chaim Chesler, in case people don't know him. He's somewhat involved in Limud FSU for a long time. I want to we just finish our conference last week in Moscow. We have over 2,000 participants because we don't have in the Moscow area larger com compounds that can host more. We could host 3,000. But the unique thing is already 11 years in uh, Moscow. We started in Domuchonok about 11 years ago for a day. And we brought buses from Smolensk, from Tver, from, <laughs> from for free trip to Moscow. But that was only a start. And ever since we cannot stop because all the secular and also different kind of from orthodox, conservative, reform, atheist, everybody is combined. And the funniest part, and uh, which we com were completely surprised, what Matthew said, uh, when Sandra and myself came to Ber El Azar 12 years ago, and we told them what we're going to do the project, he said, I will come in order to honor the, the, father, the late father of Matthew Wolfman. I'll come. And also I heard that Shayevich is coming, so he has to come. The following year, he said, okay, this is the last time, like all the other initiative, it will fail. Again, he said in the Monte Carlo two years ago in front of Shimon Peres, two months before he passed away. He said, I never believe it will happen, but it happened bigger than I ever thought, and I want to be a part of it. And I want to tell you the reason why I asked to say it, because I tell you something that nobody in this hall knows. One of the conditions that Per Lazav put to us we gave him a condition that we want to remain as we are. But he conditioned us on one issue. He said he want to have kashrut. But kashrut, super, not kashrut uh, lifestyle, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big difference in cost. But that's not the real issue. The real issue, how to... kashrut edible and kashrut not edible. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I tell you, Mr. the problem was not the kosher. The problem, how you make plasma, kosher. It's a huge project because Klasma, Klasma is the conference center in Moscow. Klasma. Belong to the uh, young communist or whatever for many, many years. So it's a big issue. So Beryl Azar said, you go for kosher, I'll make sure Klasma did it. And you know what he did? He wrote a letter to Putin. He said, we need your help to make Klasma kosher. And Putin did it. Okay, let's, let's hear it for Boris Putin. <laughs> Thank you. So, 
<laughs> I do want to open it up to, in a, in, a, in a few minutes, to open it up to questions from the audience, so if you want to think about those. Um, but you both mentioned the importance of, um, of activity, Jewish activities on campus, and I think a, a certainly a, a major issue is, the, is support for Israel. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about that in terms of your philanthropy, because uh, as we know, Israel used to be the great uh, uniter among diaspora Jews, and for any number of reasons, the uh, last number of years, in, in some ways, it's become the great divider, uh, even within the Jewish community. So uh, if you could talk a little bit about in terms of support for Israel, philanthropic support for Israel, um, does, does the political situation there, ha is that a factor in your giving or in terms of wh what causes you support um, or just how you approach the, uh, the, the whole issue about uh, philanthropy for Israel? We'll start with you, Matthew. So I, I think your premise is correct that, <coughs> that Israel was the great uniter and today it's more divisive. Uh, <coughs> I think that people have become more political in their in their views and, and not sort of just blindly in a way giving giving to Israel. For me, <coughs> um, I do I do uh, I do a fair amount of business in Israel. Um, we don't we I don't think we you know we don't give a lot of money in Israel, uh, which is which is a change. You know, when I when I my father used to say, Israel is a place you give money to. It's not a place you do business in. And and from my standpoint, it, it changed. Israel doesn't really need yet, and I, and I don't mean to take away. We do support uh, through our companies there. We support um, mostly uh, disadvantaged kids, uh, han mentally handicapped, physically handicapped, etc. That's sort of our uh, our thing. And together, and and my wife's view is anything to do with soldiers, whether it's wounded soldiers or lone soldiers or families of, of soldiers who have been killed, that's kind of her thing. But in, in terms of sort of the general view of 25 or 35 or 45 years ago, where Israel wasn't going to survive without our philanthropy, that doesn't exist anymore in my view. Israel's a strong country, thank God, economically it's incredibly strong, militarily it's strong. So again, if it's if children, soldiers, uh, you know, there's, a, there's an organization, Beit Ruth, which is for battered and underprivileged women, Y particularly young women. There are all sorts of great organizations, just like there are here. So I think that unfortunately there's the political issue, but Israel, thank God, is strong economically, so it's not as imperative as it used to be. You know, my, my personal view is that uh, unless you live in Israel and let's say your children go to the army, is 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 really not appropriate to dictate to Israelis what they should be doing or not be doing politically. Um, they can vote in their elections. It's a democracy. So um, you know, if you want to help, help. But I, I don't think it's appropriate to lecture them. Um, so I um, I also do a lot of business there. Sometimes it feels like philanthropy anyway. <laughs> right, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, at least in terms of effort <laughs> for the dollar received and um, uh, but I also kind of do the same thing you know I, I, I give quite a bit of money to Tel Aviv University which is education and um, as well of you know for instance soldiers for education um, so more or less the same teams as I have everywhere else um, and um, you know Israel is, is doing very well, so um, I think anything we do in those areas, at least I think, you know, kind of makes it stronger. Um, and, um, you, you know, going back to the politics, you know, it's, it's a very real democracy with all the corresponding problems of a very vibrant uh, democracy with a uh, very vicious political uh, process and very vicious press. Uh, but it is, it is a democracy. Um, so in the end, you kind of have to, uh, if you believe in democracy, you have to support it. So in terms of um, the engagement of younger people, which is a, a big priority for, for, for many, um, many involved in the Jewish community, 
Is there some advice you would have, um, I'll ask you both, in terms of what the community as a whole should be doing perhaps differently in being more successful in that engagement? I think we would all probably agree that the, the most successful project um, has been Birthright Israel in terms of now at a tipping point where uh, the, the majority of young Jews between 18 and 26 around the world are going to have a free Israel experience. And uh, evaluations over the years have shown that it's had a very positive influence that goes on. Um, it, it's not just a 10-day uh, experience, but it affects the rest of their lives. Um, and yet at the same time, we, we are very obsessed with um, younger people being disenfranchised from Israel and disengaged. I wonder your thoughts about that approach. Um, <coughs> I think birthright is, is amazing. Um, and as you said, the studies have proved <coughs> how incredibly impactful it is. Uh, I think one of the challenges that, that birthright has acknowledged, and I think the Federation acknowledges, there's the sort of the birthright next. Mm -hmm. Birthright next has never been able to really, or whatever form it's, it's happened in, has never really uh, been able to galvanize because people come back and, and as much as it's impacted their, their life, they still get back to their every day. Um, <coughs> there's a, a new book that just came out called New Power, uh, written by the executive director, of, uh, it's co-authored co or two, but one is the executive director of the 92nd Street Y, uh, talking about basically <coughs> social media and how you engage millennials. And I think it's a, a, a read, that uh, a book everybody should read. It, I think it answers a lot of these questions, um, and it, you know, we need we need, as I said earlier, we need to engage millennials on issues where you know where they are, not where we are. Um, having said that, or in addition to that, <coughs> somebody once asked me, um, it was a long time ago. I think we had just uh, made our investment in Discount Bank, so it was about twelve or fifteen years ago, and um, somebody said, "How do you get?" North American Jews to invest in Israel? And I said, I think you're asking the wrong question. I said, the question is, how do you get people to fall in love with Israel? Once you get them to fall in love with Israel, the rest happens by itself. Because um, I don't think investing is the, is the key. So birthright gets people to fall in love with Israel, which is one of the reasons it's, it's so impactful. Um, I, you would know, Gary, much better than I would, the percentage of North American Jews that have been to Israel, but it's a pretty low number. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I think birthright is amazing, and I think there should be adult birthrights. I think there, what, how, whatever we can do to encourage our friends through whatever organizations we're involved in, the more trips to Israel, the better. I think when you see, one of the things we do, by the way, another hat I, I wear um, is I'm chairman of the board of trustees of AJC, and we run a, a series of programs every year called Project Interchange where we bring non-Jews, we bring parliamentarians, journalists, university presidents, majority of non-Jews to Israel to see what's really going on, and that also has a big impact because that impacts media, it impacts campuses, et cetera. Um, and once people see the challenges, and as Len said, the vibrant democracy that goes on there, and it's, it's not, if, you, if all you do is watch CNN, you'd think it's a military state. And it's the last thing Israel is is a military state. It's the most interesting, vibrant social and social place and democracy and the food scene and the art scene. Uh, it's the music scene, it's whatever it is, you're on the beach, it's, it's, it's an incredible place. So I think you need to, we need to get people there and that will change their view. Well, I couldn't say it better than Matthew, so I would just um, add a bit. Um, I actually, I think it's a great idea, adult birthright. <laughs> I would probably add that um, you have to find a way to, for people to pay at least a little bit. Because when it's free, you know, it's not appreciated. Yeah, so maybe it should be some sort of a matching rent. Um, and from my experience, um, yeah, from all over the world, uh, you know, young people, not Jewish, um, who come to Israel, they, they fall in love. So the more it can be done, the, the better. And, and yeah, birthright is fantastic. Um, so the more, the better. <laughs> yeah. I think in, in South America, the, they, um, the people who go on birthright do pay a certain amount. Uh, or th they can get their money back a afterwards, and many, most of them don't do that. They make that a contribution. I don't know if, uh, what if, if that's being discussed here. But, um, so just... I want Len to know that all the participants have been moved. Okay. Oh, okay. It's very important just to get that 
exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. When we subsidize it, but and that's why we're here and you give and, and a number of our supporters are here. But everybody pays, and it's, it's exactly what you said. If it's free, you don't appreciate it. So it's hundred percent. Most of them pay four hundred dollars for a week. Four hundred dollars, and we get over two thousand people. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It must be the kosher food. So I don't know if I would go. <laughs> 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 anyway, we have 55,000 graduates of Kadik only in the form of sugar cane. Right. But this right. 400, do people pay or somebody pays for them? Yeah. No, no, they, they, they pay, pay 400. Yeah. We, we rent from other, uh, like, private donors, like Matthew and you, Sandra and others, um. and we get uh, support from the French Conference, the JDP. We mean little, little bit from the Jewish Agency. On average, on average, correct me if I'm wrong, Jamie, it's fine. Uh, but but about forty percent of our global costs are covered by participation fees, and about sixty percent is from donors. But came and just gave what they wanted. And now, 10 years later, they're paying a huge amount for the weekend because they have perceived value. They fell in love with the program. It's theirs. And they grew to understand they need to pay. Okay. Okay. The, the, the main thing is maybe Russia. Even in Moldova, Moldova, in Bela Russia, they pay. Sometimes up to the salary. OK. Uh, before we open it up to some questions um, from from you, I just was going to ask you each if you have any advice um, for Amcha, uh, for uh, people with moderate means in terms of how they can be most effective in supporting Jewish causes. Well, I think it, it gets back to the, the first when you asked about mentors, and I talked about watching my dad, it wasn't just about writing checks, it was about getting involved, uh, sort of uh, leading by example with your feet, with your, with your passion and with your brains. And, if, and that, you know, they used to say when you're sitting on a board, uh, it was wealth, wisdom, uh, are, are the things that were needed, and, 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 and work. Those are the three W's, right? If you want to be on a board, wealth, wisdom, and work. And, if you don't, and it's one, two, or all three. So work, get involved, whatever you're passionate about. That's, uh, that was what I would say. And I don't think it, all three are incredibly <laughs> valuable to the Jewish community, not one more than the other. So if you have modest means, so what? You know, give your effort, give your brains, give your time. Uh, and I think you're, you're adding a huge, huge amount. Another option, make more money and um, <laughs> give more. <laughs> Keep that in mind, everyone. That's a good idea. Uh, so I'm going to ask, I know this is a Jewish audience, so I'm going to ask you to make your question in the form of a question. Uh, and to keep it brief, and, uh, and then we'll try and see how many we can handle there. So gentlemen in the back. You know, I might be a wrong person. You know, I, I think what Sheldon Edelson does is, is really very impressive uh, in Jewish causes. You know, Gates Foundation, and really I don't know enough, is, is it does these big projects in Africa, for instance. I, you know, I think they should be doing more in America. Maybe they are doing more in America. I, I just don't know enough. But they're very large-scale things, which I frankly don't be re believe in, in kind of a industrial scale philanthropy, you know, but, uh, but again, everyone should be doing what, what they want to be doing. It's their money. Uh, but Matthew might know more as a scholar of, of uh, philanthropy. Well, I, I appreciate the compliment, but it's not very well deserved. So um, the fact is, I don't really know. What I do know is that um, as, 
as there's been more wealth created in the United States and more family offices have been created, part of those offices people create their own foundations. I think the ones that are more effective are the ones that spend the time to think about how they want to give their money. Um, uh, for instance, my uncle hired a guy named Jeff Solomon who's uh, really very thoughtful. My, my father had somebody who ran his foundation. I think people all over the United States have people that think about how they want to give their money and to what they want to give their money. I happen to agree with Len also that uh, more granular giving uh, is is um, is very 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 necessary when on the local community, uh, all the way all the way up to you know Bill Gates' foundation uh, trying to create you know amazing change in healthcare in Africa, uh, but I think giving money ad hoc is where you end up kind of like investing. By the way, if if you just sort of throw money at different investments, you're probably not going to be very successful. Um, and I would and I would say if, if if you ask Len about the investment side, they have an incredibly rigorous process uh, and investment committees, et cetera, before they, before they make an investment. And if you apply that to philanthropy, I think you'll also have better results. Thank um, you. I'm curious to know if um, Lamud uh, is working with or is planning to work with universities directly, um, just because you know we are at in a university right now, and I attend this university, so I'm curious. If, if you will get a look at the university, I'll cooperate with the university. Yeah, you can. So I served on the, I serve on the international board of uh, directors of Hillel, and I can tell you that in many cases, especially all over the world actually, we are partners with Hillel. Um, and in the former Soviet Union, the Hillel leaders are part of our leadership, and it's they're tremendously important. And in the United States, and um, also Hillel. Young people are part of our participants, our organizing committee, et cetera. It depends, you know, today happens to be International BDS Day on campuses, so you won't see too many Hillel kids here because they're uh, protesting and picketing or whatever, but yes, Hillel is an important factor, absolutely. You let, you, let, you let me say also a few words about this issue. <laughs> 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 what, we, what we do, first of all, we have limited budget, and we need to give the credit for those volunteers which all year round, for instance, the operation in Moscow, to put 2,000 with a great program, it takes us six months. Six months, a group of 50 youngsters are working on the program without money as a volunteer. In university, if we had more money or if we got uh, more... Uh, uh, budget from the Israeli government, which it doesn't give us the money yet, but if they would, uh, we could enlarge our operation. But for instance, what we did in a small item, which was very effective. You see, one of the issues of Limud is to give the pride to the Russian heritage and history, which they are very proud of. So I'll give you an example. Leonard Cohen, his grandfather is from Ukraine. So we went to our big event in San Francisco. On the way to San Francisco, we stopped in UCLA and we have a big event about Leonard Cohen, which lived not very far from USA, UCLA. And all Hillel people came to be with us in this issue, and it was a big, big event. Then we went to San Francisco. San Francisco, we did something for another one from, Ode from uh, Ukraine, Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, grandparents come from uh, Odessa. So we had a huge event in San Francisco, in Hillel, about this. So this is how we combine usually things which give the, the Russian local pride, and also we get in contact with the universities. But this is only a matter of budget. If we have more budget, we'll have more activity. Yes, sir. Thank you for your patience. Yes. So, um, there is a very interesting book written by, uh, I, I, can, I can pick it up now. It's okay. Uh, it's okay, I don't want to know. 
So there is this wonderful book written by uh, Scott Shea, who is a chairman. Listen, I, I, Scott's, a, Scott's a friend of mine, um, and I think, I think it, the answer gets back to, first, first of all, you're right in that, and he's right, in that uh, Jewish day school is very expensive, Jewish camping is very expensive. Um, you know, at the 92nd Street Y, where we run a lot of, a lot of camps, um, uh, one of the, the things we do at our annual gala is we ask for people to designate specifically for camp scholarships. Um, but it gets to what Len said. People need to give to what's, what they, you know, you have to, what they are passionate about. Um, Jewish camping is. I think a lot of studies have shown that Jewish camping is a great way to keep Jewish kids engaged in Jewish life. Um, uh, obviously, Jewish day school. Uh, I mean, I send kids, my kids, to Jewish day school. Uh, I can afford it, so I'm, I'm lucky. But I know that there a lot of the fundraising from the schools for scholarships, you know, for like every school, scholarships and, and teachers. Um, it's it's an issue in the community, and and I. But again, you know, if if your grandchild of survivors, you're probably going to give to a Holocaust museum, um, you know. In, so you have to let people give where where they feel it's important for them to give. But yes, Jewish camping does have a great impact on on the future of the Jewish community, as does Jewish day school. I just, I just would add, I just came across a statistic in the last uh, week or so that uh, about 70% of Jewish museums in the world are Holocaust related. Uh, and this was someone suggesting that we, we need uh, some you know, more positive information about Jewish life. Um, just to put that out there. Okay. Hi. It's working. Hi, my name is Yair. I'm a journalist from Israel. I'm really excited uh, to be here and to meet uh, all the Limud organization. It's really amazing thing. I just want to ask in your eyes, what is the issues, the conflicts of the Jewish community, Russian Jewish community in the United States? Um, Opposite the Jewish communities, the Halabim community, or the or the Syrian community, or the Lebanese community, there is. I just want to ask if, in your eyes, if there is some some unique conflicts with the Jewish uh, Russian after you know after the, um, I would say Masacha <laughs> Barzel. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. After the curtain and after all the the problems with the uh, Jewish their their life of the Jewish. I really have no idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the reality is that, um, from what I can tell, the majority of uh, Jewish community, uh, Rush, let's call it Russian Jewish community, um, came to this country from the immigration of the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. And, and by now, you know, it's really 
the, the children who are making their way. And they will, you know, not all of course, but you know, most, I would assume most are well integrated and really at this point uh, probably more American than, than Russian. You know, hopefully they're Jewish. Um, so, and you know, from what I've seen, and again, yeah, I might be the wrong person, and I've seen, say, say, so say, Syrian uh, Jewish community. You're talking about Syrian Jewish, right? Not just Syrian, right? <laughs> uh, you know, they're, they're actually kind of, what I've seen, quite uh, tightly connected, and they, you know, uh, try to stay together, and, uh, and, and, and culturally very similar. And um, I think the Russian, Russian one by the second, third generation begins to uh, kind of um, assimilate into the mainstream and become your know, average American Jewish uh, community. Um, uh, but you know, everyone again, everyone finds their own way. I, you know, I'm not a great scholar on the subject. I, I want to go back to the Holocaust issue, um, if I may. You know, I, my, my personal view is that there might be too much, still too much conversation about Jewish suffering. And that, that's kind of, uh, you know, that maybe comes from the mothers, but uh, the Holocaust uh, obviously is a major, uh, of course, the issue in Jewish life. But there are, you know, so many museums and so many conversations and the teaching is necessary. But wh what's missing uh, to some degree is, um, um, education about, you know, the, uh, say, Jewish heroism in, in World War II, the same way. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in the Soviet army, there were 500,000 Jews. In um, in American army, I think they were close to the same number, 550. Um, so that is not, you, you don't really hear about it much, but you always hear about the suffering. And I think actually that's a wrong wrong message for the young generation. Um, and a plug for my effort, uh, you know, I have something called Blavatnik Archives. Yeah. You can go to the website. That's uh, exactly about uh, the Jewish, uh, um, you know, Jews who were in the Soviet army, mm -hmm. either soldiers or partisans or resistance fighters. And, you know, you have a lot of incredible personal stories. So visit that website, Blavatnik Archives. <laughs> we had you last year. You are part of Cato Underground. Uh -huh. Oh, great. OK, great, yeah. Thanks, Len, uh, for, for passing me the microphone on that one. Um, <coughs> Howard, you may want to say something about that. Um, I, I can only tell you from, from example, the, the person who r ran my father's foundation forever was, was a, and still does, even though he passed away a few years ago, is a woman uh, at the, the board of the 92nd Street Y. I think where 40% of the board is women, and of the center directors, it's probably 30 to 40 to 50. I don't know exactly, but it's... It's a very high number. Um, so it's probably organization by organization. Um, and I, I am not a student of this. I don't know the statistics you just, so I'm only going to give you from my personal experience. Um, so it doesn't, 
you know, I don't know if there's actually, there's certainly at, at, our, at the Y, there's no pay, pay disparity. Um, at, the, uh, at the AJC, uh, the people who run our institutes around the world, I'm just sort of going through it in my head, in Berlin is a woman, in Paris is a woman, in uh, Israel is a woman, in Poland is a woman, in, no, in, uh, in Brussels is a man, in Mexico is a woman. So it's, there's no, and I'm sure if I went through there'd be, a, uh, and the, the, the ones who are in the United States, uh, the one in Chicago is a man, but I mean, so it's very, it's very balanced and it's not that there's more or less, it's that there's no, it's all meritorious. It's not, there's, it's very simple. Um, so I, maybe I'm the wrong one to address the issue, but I don't see it. And, and the question is, do you exercise power? I mean, I'm sure without speak, without knowing, I'm sure Len's view is exactly the same. It should, it should all be based on merit um, and not on, not on gender. Um, I don't know about maternity leave issues uh, for whatever the organization was you're talking about, or if that's uh, a requirement for a grant application that's just not something I know about, so I can't really comment on it. Okay. I, I'm afraid we're out of time, um, but I want to, uh, again, thank all of you and particularly thank... Oh, okay. We're not out of time. Getting, I'm getting mixed signals. Okay, we'll take one more. I think to a large extent we've, we've answered that question uh, from a philanthropic standpoint. Uh, I think it's actually incumbent on, in this case, because he's sitting in the chair today, Naftali Bennett uh, and other Israeli government to allocate the money to have Israelis, whether it's through the consulates or the embassies or on campus, people like yourself, coming around and meeting with and engaging young Jews here. But I, I think that's really important for the, for the state of Israel to do that, for the government to do that. Okay. Uh, okay. So we're going to have to stop right now. Okay. Uh, so again, I want to uh, thank you all. I want to thank uh, Matthew and Sir Leonard, and it's been a pleasure. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day at Limud.